I welcome you to this session called Triclip Therapy Here Now, Here to Stay, sponsored by Abbott. My name is Georg Nikinik and I welcome you to this session on behalf of my co-moderator, Marta Sitges, to my, to my right. And I would like to introduce also the rest of the fac uh, faculty. There's Fabian Bratz here from, from Switzerland, from Zürich, Stefan von Badeleben from Mainz and Rafi Becheran from Stuttgart. So I hope it's going to be a nice session all together. So what will be the uh, learning objective? for this session, uh, we're going to try to understand the triclip therapy a bit better and the outcomes in the, in the real world patients. We're going to discuss that with you. We hopefully can show you that the performance of this device is, is rather versatile in all kinds of different patient selections. And we would like to also discuss with you that you can apply this tier device uh, in most patients and most anatomies. And without further ado, I would like to hand over to my co-moderator. Th thank you, Gorg. So welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us. We ho hope to have a very jo uh, productive discussion. So it's of most importance that you, we encourage you to ask questions. You can us use uh, the chat online. Christopher Meduria from Estocolm will be managing it and I will be introducing questions. But if for those who are on site, if you want to use the micro, please also feel free. But please ask your questions and this will contribute to our discussion. Well, thank you, Marta. This is very, very important. So don't be shy. <laughs> Just get up and ask any questions. And now it's up to Fabian Bratz. He's going to introduce the b right study and also give some insights between Beorite and Triluminate and between the different devices we had in the former days and now the Gen 4 device. So it's Absolutely. a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Georg, for the introduction. So let's, let's have a look at the late-breaking uh, clinical trial data that were presented uh, this morning on the Beorite study again uh, for those who have seen it uh, once, once time already. Uh, but I think it's very interesting. And we will, you will see we will go much deeper into this data uh, during this session and uh, discuss um, all the aspects of this, of this data. So the, the PI of the study is Philip Lourdes. He has presented this, uh, this morning, 30 days outcome. Uh, the study is a single arm uh, study, including post-market patients uh, treating with a Triclip uh, device and Triclip J4. So we have two generations of the device into, into the study. And the objective is to evaluate and to, to catch the, the safety and effectiveness of this therapy in a real world setting in patient treated uh, real world uh, after, um, after uh, approval of the, of the device. It's, pro it's prospective and uh, with inclusion of 500 uh, patients. The primary endpoint is acute uh, procedural reduction of uh, tricuspid regurgitation by one grade. And there are also secondary endpoints uh, regarding all cause mortality, but also uh, uh, you will see um, uh, adverse event, and we will come back on this uh, in, in a minute. So inclusion, symptomatic patient with severe TR, and exclusion criteria, you see very few actually, patient with uh, severe pulmonary hypertension, more than 60, uh, and severe mitral regurgitation as well. And that's a baseline characteristic, and you will recognize a type of uh, quite uh, typical uh, population of patients uh, with tricuspid regurgitation, older patient, 85% uh, of atrial fibrillation, some patient having uh, pre-operation or pre-intervention on the left side, um, uh, preserve right ventricular function, and most of them having massive or torrential uh, tricuspid regurgitation, leading to symptoms in, uh, and severe symptoms in 80% of the, of the patient. So that's uh, the, the result with a very high implant success with this uh, device, an acute procedural success. Uh, remind, uh, it's, uh, it's a reduction of TR by one grade in 91% uh, of, the, of the patient. And if you look at reduction to moderate or less than 71% of the patient reach this, uh, this landmark. 
The flipping strategy uh, may be uh, expected a bit, but, a bit, but interesting. In most of the patients, we, we are clipping the anteroceptal commissure. In some of the patients, both the anteroceptal and the posteroceptal commissure, and only uh, clipping of other commissure uh, than, than the anteroceptal is, uh, is quite rare, as you can see on, on this graph. And if you look at the safety profile, uh, what is very important and uh, quite impressive as well, as well is a high safety of this procedure with a MACE rate of 1% at 30 days and a cardiovascular mortality of 0.3. Uh, you see also that all the outcomes uh, were quite low, uh, including single leaflet uh, device attachment, no embolization, and also very low rate of uh, tricuspid valve stenosis. And this good outcome, safe outcome, reflected also in a functional improvement. You can see that the uh, Almost 80% were in NYHA class 3 or 4 at the beginning. Um, after 30 days, 78% uh, of the patients are in class 1 or 2. And this reflects, of course, into quality of life as well. So I just would like to go uh, into some more detail regarding the new generation of the device. And as I mentioned, not all the patients in that study were treated with that device, with Triclip Gen 4. About 30% of these patients were, were treated uh, with this device. And what is uh, part particular um, with this system is on one side the control gripper actuation. So you are able here uh, with this uh, leverage to uh, activate, actuate the gripper separately um, to do independent grasping or leaflet optimization. And I will show an example in, in one minute. The second feature, what is new uh, with the trick clip and particular for the track clip device, is this knob where you can turn uh, and move the catheter on the lateral and septal side of the valve in a clean movement in, able to, in, in order to adjust your angulation toward the valve. And the third characteristic, which is also very important, if some of you uh, remind uh, doing off-label um, uh, tree clip with a mitra clip, is a change of the curve. This curve is much uh, smaller and allow you to have a lot more height uh, toward the tricuspid valve, which is also extremely useful. And finally, we have now four different sizes uh, of, the, of the device to be able to address different uh, anatomical situations um, with the XTW use in, uh, in the majority of the, of the cases. If we look now at this specific feature, which is extremely important, it's not only independent leaflet grasping, but it's also the optimization of the, of the leaflet grasping, very important for tricuspid procedure. So what you can see here, the gripper is down, and we have not the leaflet completely in in that situation. So what you will to typically, typically do in that particular situation, you will <laughs> reopen you will reopen the gripper, which you can do using this leverage here on the, on the side. Here you reopen it, you move the catheter towards the leaflet, which is not completely grasped, and you optimize it, and then finally we will close completely the device. And this, if we, if we look um, uh, at the, the, the final situation, you can see that the leaflet is completely in the device and you will be able to grasp as much tissue as possible. And Georg mentioned it, so if we compare now the early situation, the early population in the trial minute trial, we see that we have an increase of complexity of the patient treated now specifically with the G4 generation device. You see that the vast majority of these patients are massive and torrential tricuspid regurgitation with bigger gap, and despite of this increase into the complexity, thanks to the technical improvement, but also to the increasing experience, we, we are still able to reach better result in terms of reduction to, uh, of TR to moderate or less in that complex population of patients. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for this uh, wonderful presentation. I think we should right now go to the patient, uh, patient presentation. And I learned that this is on the movie already. And after this, we, we have some time to discuss and receive your questions. Another warm welcome from the Hartwell Center of the University of Medicine in Mainz, Germany. We're about to perform another case uh, of uh, Generation 4 triclip. Uh, in a functional uh, tricuspic regurgitation. Uh, it's my great pleasure to perform this procedure together with my colleague Tobias Roof, who is here on my side, uh, and Jacqueline La Rocha, who is on the ECHO. And Tobias, would you like to introduce the case to the audience? Yes, thank you, Stefan. 
So we have a patient here who came into the hospital due to repeat um, decompensated heart failure. It's a 77-year-old male um, suffering from dyspnea in the class uh, NUHA 3 and mainly fatigue. In the history, we see permanent atrial fibrillation, um, diabetes type 2 on oral anti-diabetics. Laboratory showed elevated values for NT-proBNP and a GFR of 54. The right heart cath showed um, elevated um, systolic and mean pulmonary pressures with 61 millimeters of mercury systolic and 38 uh, mean pressure with a wedge pressure of 23 millimeters of mercury and a resistance of two wood units. In echocardiography, we can appreciate normal left and right ventricular function. However, um, the um, right ventricle as well as the right atrium are severely enlarged. Tricuspid annulus is also enlarged with 50 millimeters and there's a central coaptation gap of seven millimeters uh, leading to a TR of three of five. In the heart team, we assessed the risk and decided, obviously, for transcatheter edge to edge repair due to a mortality uh, of 1.72% in the Euroscore 2, but a mortality of 8% using the TRI score. Uh, Jacqueline, could you just take us uh, into the baseline? of this patient from an echocardiographic standpoint. Thank you, Stefan. This is a uh, severe dilated annulus, uh, atrial dilatation, right ventricle dilatation, secondary uh, three, uh, TR, as uh, Tobias already said, severe uh, three and five uh, TR. Here in the inflow outflow, uh, we can see the annulus dilation and we can also see that the septal leaflet is, uh, uh, has a tethering as uh, to expect here, uh, the, again, the jet is a central posterior jet. And here in the transgastric view, we can appreciate uh, all the leaflets. With the color Doppler, we can see that the central uh, coaptation depth, uh, this, is, this central gap is almost seven uh, millimeter. Out. Yeah, thank you very much. So, so I think it's a typical case of uh, a right heart enlargement, also of atrial enlargement. And this is one of the most difficult valves because it's a quadruspid valve. Uh, Jacqueline, can you show this? Um, it's a very important where your arrow is that we have two septal leaflets and we have two or three uh, femoral leaflets. Actually, we have one A1, which is not too large. We have the anterior papillary muscle. We have a secondary <laughs> a free papillary muscle to the posterior, which is separating a P1 from a P2. So we have four or five leaflets in this case, and it will be interesting how to address those. And we'll try to use the posterior septal leaflet as an anchor leaflet, but we'll see how much we'll proceed. Okay, thank you very much. So we have a, a couple of, we are still perfectly in time. We have a couple of minutes to discuss. Maybe I start with you. You showed us this beautiful data uh, from, from B right, and you showed us that most of the patient ended, ended this study. Also, it was almost a real world type of all comers study with torrential or massive TR, and the results look very impressive. And you gave us some hints why that could be. I mean, what would be your personal opinion? Is it due to the better device? Is, is there still better patient selection? Or is it due to the experience of the operators? Or Altogether, I think you already answered the question. I think all these factors play an a very important role and I think on, on one side we have technical improvement that's clear and uh, and the use of different sizes of the device but also you know the, the ability to have better angulation better access to the valve are certainly key but on the other side we understand a little bit better which patient benefit uh, from an anatomical point of view from this therapy and in which patient we are really able to reduce tricuspid regurgitation uh, best with transcatheter edge to edge repair. And the third point is of course the, the experience of the operator, but I would say not only the operator as an interventional cardiologist, but the team and the team include of course imaging and selection of the patient. That is a very good uh, keyword, imaging. Does 
play imaging here a role that we have this beautiful data? Uh, I think that imaging plays an essential role in the selection. I'm sorry, I'm an imager, I have to say that. <laughs> but I think it's a, a key role in understanding what's happening on the valve and on planning the strategy. So I think further development may, may be needed, um, particularly somebody was asking here in the, in the chat uh, that maybe Stefan wants to, to further comment on the role of eyes in the future. But I think imaging is key in the, in the selection of uh, adequate patients, or also, of course, clinical factors, because probably now we are treating very advanced stages of disease, and even in those advanced stages of disease, we have good results. So the future is even more promising. Mm -hmm. And also is key on uh, developing the, the uh, applying the therapy no? for guiding the procedure. So I don't know if Stefan wants to comment on, on, on ICE. Uh, uh, shortly, shortly. Short there. There's one, one up to two uh, <laughs> vendors that have ice probes. They're three-dimensional now. <laughs> we have short apertures, which is 90 by 50 degrees, but we can now do even conscious non-TOE uh, interventions in selected patients, especially if their uh, prosthesis is in the aortic and mitral position. Then okay. it's very helpful. Yeah, of course. And another question maybe to you. Uh, we have four different devices. Uh, which, w which one are you usually using? Is this also a part of the deal that we are getting better results? Selection of the device? Yeah, it, it certainly is. And uh, I think it is very important that we have the option to use at least uh, the larger sizes now because mostly we, we do need larger sizes. And um, with the tricuspid valve that is a larger valve, uh, it is really helpful to have the XTW or XT device. But again, in very few cases, sometimes uh, you do use also smaller devices. And there is also uh, some. Um, uh, relation to the center experience, of course. There are also centers that prefer the smaller devices, So, but this allows us to have a very individual approach both for the patient and for the interventionist. That was back in the United States that they used a smaller device. I hope they gave up on this, but we need to go to the presentation. Uh, I think the case presentation, we are a bit behind time, but just a few seconds. seconds. <laughs> so could you play the video, please? We now go into the procedure. So we have a stiff wire already in the uh, superior uh, cable vein. Which is, so this is the groin excess, as we see. We predilate here with 20 French. We also have already have the anti-gliding MAF here, and we'll now put on the stabilizer and then get the system in. It's very important to... Don't rub it, but to, to engage the hydrophilic coating. Can you counterclock like this? This follows nicely the anatomy. We're coming up. We're a superior cable vein. Can I just get the stent? Perfect. We'll now remove the dilator and the wire. So first the dilator into this device. Now the wire into the device, you saw this nicely in echo, fully straddled system. We turn very much interior, and now we give some L, anterior maneuver. Six hours L frees us from the septum, then three hours plus, and some flex down to the valve. So we want to be in the middle of the valve, but we don't want to come from the septum. So I show you, here we are perpendicular or next flat to the septum. And this is a possibility that I have. If I remove L, I'm glued to the septum. If I want to move away into the middle of the tricuspic valve, I simply engage more L. And you see that I move in parallel away from the septum. And now I'm in the cooptation of the valve. So you're unlocking the system and we're opening the system now in a perfect rotation. And you should align a little bit to fluoroscopy. And why do we do that? Why because fluoroscopy by most anatomies shows me that an REO 20 to 30 and a caudal 5 to cranial 10 or 15 gives me the perfect perpendicularity. Okay. I now move to the cooptation and you show the gripper control, please. Okay. I use the gripper lever and put it all down and we can appreciate that both grippers go down. Then I disengage the lever and I can uh, separately move up again. So I start with the tactile marker. In this case, it is the septal gripper that is moving upwards. And the other one, 
is to the free wall and perfect so we continue we're all set already we'll check the path and we go in and you see i'm going totally straight so now the next step is for jacqueline to go into the transgastric view and here you see we're already right in the middle of the valve we are crossing the valve just with the end of the arms of the clip and no further because we don't want to get engaged into the quartz which are very dense in the space. By moving up and down, we see that our rotation is already perfect. The septal leaflet is twofold and we try to engage the central leaflet and we make sure that we actually engage exactly the tip of the leaflets. I try to be below the papillary muscle and to get into the central leaflet. We may have to engage here uh, the uh, curper plate independently. We'll see that. Okay, now. Looks good. You have both. Mm -hmm. Sometimes very you have nice. to be fast. Yeah. yeah, very nice. You see that the leaflets connect nicely into the center of the clip. And I immediately use this for a simultaneous grasp because this is the safest you can do uh, in such a valve. It looks very good. And here you good. see the leaflets go nicely yeah. and tethered into the device. Angle. Shown yeah. the color, we already see a nice reduction. No gradients, yeah, that's the, also important. Nice we reduction. should stress this too for the audience. Here, look at this. Yep. Definitely Looks already better. pretty well. Yes. And we go to a posterior position in order to control the all fast view. This is a very nice final arm angle position. Now the clip is totally closed. So here's the lock so line. Looks good. Draw the line very slowly and controlled to make sure that there are no knots or anything else. We do a second and final arm angle. Still stays closed. And now we release the device again in a perpendicular view. So. Very nice. Yeah, very nice. Very stable. Some okay. And you see, and it's a, a very nice uh, tray situation. Yes, very nice. We'll change the device to an XTW. So you see we're at the septum, so I have to make sure that I don't really get with a lot of push into the aorta or into the interatrial septum or a PFO. So I move away a little bit. You will see me bending in a second. I get straddled and now I deploy L as a first step. And you see this moves me away from the step. Then you add some plus. And now we flex down. So we have a septal hugger here on the right image in the four chamber view. So I immediately give some L. I move into the middle of the valve. I move the system slightly in. I release some flex. And here we are and we test the system. Okay, Stefan, now we have placed the first clip as in most cases, septal anterior, the second clip. Do we do a clover or do we do a continuation? It's, it's, it's a good question because here actually we could also continue, uh, to be honest, because uh, we saw if you give us a color, it's only behind the first clip and we have elongation capabilities there. So we come in. I approximate to the first clip. Yeah, it looks very good. Uh, you have both here. Let's see that we engage the leaflets. I give more flex. Now you see the leaflets yeah. tips crossing. Okay, check it. Yeah. Well, Jacqueline shows us uh, the leaflet insertion from... Yes, and you see it's very nice. Yeah. Short. Looks good. Both leaflets are taut. Leaflet. Mm -hmm. Both are taut, both are stretched, both are very straight in. She has to give the right angulation because, of course, yeah. there is the posterior leaflet one, which is free. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have the right angulation, if you're going to 95, you have to go to 60. 
So there's not one view that shows you all, but it's a combination of what you and have and what you get. Angulations, that's true. That's nice. But I think it's a nice result. Okay, yeah? okay let's go. And uh, so we got to just get the sign that the arterial pressure of the patient has increased by approximately 10 millimeters mercury, which is a good sign of increased flow and increased cardiac stroke volume output. We now remove the lock line. Okay. So second final, and they are totally in parallel. You see that, so it's a perfect elongation, again done in minutes and trace TR as a result. We take the uh, gradient and the gradient seems to be one or two in this case too. So we did not cause any stenosis whatsoever. And as you can see, no we wave. Wait a second and we get a perfect around 10 RA pressures. I think both clip sizes, XT and XTW, contributed. Yes, but, but they played a role. But why did we choose on this, this combination. step and this combination? The reason was the septal indentation. The problem is to get with a wide clip across this indentation to the posterior part of the septal leaflet. That was the key for success. And we did this with the smallest available uh, size, which was four millimeters only. And there I was able with long arms and small arms to penetrate to the posterior leaflets. Once I had this connection, I could extend uh, the, the reach of these clips and also the power of these clips to reduce TR into the next level by using a wider clip to close the gap between anterior and posterior. And this was possible with the wider six millimeter uh, device. So in total, we have one centimeter with a gap of two to three millimeters. So in total, this is a bridge of 12 millimeters. So we have seen uh, a very nice and spectacular case of a 77-year-old uh, male, uh, actually with some uh, challenges in imaging, some challenges in the appreciation of the valve. We saw uh, an artifact, a calcified artifact uh, in the transgastric view, mimicking a pacemaker probe, but as you saw in fluoroscopy, there was none. Uh, and we had a tough five leaflet tricuspid valve uh, with actually four main leaflets. And it's always difficult to do uh, let's say, subdivided uh, septal leaflets. That's, that's one of the key issues. So the strategy that we did was a double clip implant with the generation four. We did simultaneous after one uh, not uh, intentionally uh, good uh, uh, separated uh, engagement of the grasping plates and two first grasps with success, uh, starting with a small XT engaging the posterior septal with the interior leaflet and then prolonging it and extending the reach of this uh, co-optation device with a wider XTW uh, in the same location, actually. No gradients, RA pressure down to 10, uh, systolic pressure increased by 10 millimeters mercury and uh, Jacqueline, for the final images, you show us that uh, there is a distinct change in the regurgitation as we see in echo if you I'll just look on this recording, and I think we have a spectacular situation from a grade three. This was not massive or torrential, but a grade three severe regurgitation or severe to massive down to trace to mild. And I think it's a fantastic demonstration of the power of generation four triclip systems uh, in co-opting uh, right heart failure patients or right heart enlarged patients, like in this case, a dilatation. Uh, of the right atrium and the right ventricle with a superior result. Good contractile reserve for this patient, so he will diaries now and feel much better. Okay, yeah. thank you very much, and you. see you next time from the Hardwell Center in Mainz, Universitätsmedizin Mainz in Germany. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and, and congratulations to this excellent performance and the great result in, in the patient. So very well done, very beautiful pictures. So is that the typical patient you face also in Stuttgart? This is uh, part of the typical uh, situation that we face, but of course there are also some patients who are less challenging, some who are more challenging. The tricuspid valve has a large var variability and I think that's part of the uh, system here. Okay. Uh, 
Marta? Yeah, yeah, we have some questions from the audience uh, regarding the capability of independent uh, grasping, which is uh, key for, for also the optimization of the technique, and it's due to this new G4 generation. But there are also questions for the strategy used in the, um, in the, in the case. So uh, there is one question regarding the Clover technique, if you uh, can uh, explain a little bit on that. And also, if in, in retrospect, it would have been seeing the nice results and the spectacular result, but if it had been enough to put a central white in the middle as in the first shot, what do you think, Stefan? These are the two questions. Yeah, this is, these are very good questions. The nearer you come to the anterior papillary muscle, the more tethering effect and power you have on the cords uh, actually to withtract the femoral leaflets. So it's uh, very helpful not to be directly at the indentation between anterior to posterior because the forces to have a leaflet detachment are higher. Uh, we know that in double clip techniques, uh, actually detachment rates are much, much lower. And we know that we come from initially something like 7% in the tricuspic with the miskeet mitroclip systems. And we're now down to about 2.7, which is a very favorable ongoing process because all the centers get more and more experience. And we haven't faced detachments in the last 200 patients anymore. So I think it's an early learning curve situation. We also had detachments, but uh, this gets less and less. And we know this learning curve from the mitre clip. Also there, that we started with 7%, now we're at 1% detachment rate. So, so I think this is the same learning curve storyline. Okay, very good. Any any further questions? No, or if you can comment a little bit on the clover technique, I mean... What yeah, we, we, we saw in the presentation by Fabien already that the majority, about 70, 73% are done simply between a dominant anterior to septal. And the large advantage of this strategy is that we leave the leaf, uh, the valve opening very much untouched. So pe uh, permanent and also non-permanent pacemaker implant is much easier uh, if you have a free-moving posterior leaflet. So, so other therapies, also a right heart calf, et cetera, are much easier if you don't do a clover. We also do clovers, but this is a 20, 23% uh, caseload. Um, and there we uh, approach the femoral leaflet by the anterior to septal. And then we would have put a clip into the P1 to the septum. This would have also worked in this case, actually. So this is why Tobias asked me what to do. Uh, but we decided to prolong this and to close, actually, this um, residual TR because it was only one centimeter wide. So we, we decided that we could just simply prolong. So development of a gradient, is, is that an issue with this procedure or is this hard to induce anyway? It's, it's actually hardly an issue uh, in contrast to the mitral valve where you really have to look at that. Uh, it's an absolutely rare occasion that you have a gradient that is significant and that would change your strategy. Okay, and uh, maybe one question to you. Um, what is the percentage that you start with a large and wide clip? Is it 100% almost or? Well, here we started with a small or narrow and large clip. It was a long arm, 12 millimeters. Uh, actually, we started in two thirds of the patients with an XTW. Only if I want to treat more posterior, and I'm simply enabling in this case, uh, we know that the closure power of the XT is quite good, actually. Then I sometimes start to enable with an XT, but the closer I get to the commissures, I use the side brackets of the XTW. And I think in Europe, we use 98% XT and XTW, while in the US, one third is still NTW or NT. Uh, so there's a completely different approach to it. And you know, some people, colleagues from Minneapolis and other <laughs> centers uh, that really fight for the smaller clips. But I think Europe is much more they have, it, here. they have it on store, probably on the shelf. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I think uh, I think we need to move move on, and now we have two two rapid presentations by Fabien about uh, patient population, patient selection on one hand, and then gap size and subgroup analysis from B right.
please go e ahead. Exactly, exactly. Your, the, the purpose of, uh, of the presentation is to deep dive a little bit into the, 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 um, the population of patients uh, we have in B-Right and to have maybe some interesting learning also in terms of uh, the selection of the patient from an anatomical point of view. So if you look at this, uh, we are still uh, treating, as I mentioned before, on one side complex patients, but also patients that are advanced in their disease. So you see that uh, a, a quite um, a significant proportion of the patients have leaflet restriction, uh, they have tethering of the leaflet. The dead location, and that's not very surprising, is mainly anteroceptal that relate to the selection of this patient uh, probably. If you look at mor morphology, and I think that's very consistent with other study, also your study, Georg, 72% of the patient um, have a tree leaflet uh, morphology as assessed by, by core lab. Uh, regarding annulus size, uh, most of the patients are between uh, 5 and 4 centimeters, so all dilated. Uh, the, there is uh, only a very small proportion of patients below 4 centimeters who are treated in this registry. And, uh, and finally, if you look at, at gap size, and that's uh, interesting, uh, and I will, I will come back on this, uh, you see that most of the patients are in the range of, of 7 to 10 millimeters, uh, but that the distribution is quite broad. So maybe we can, we can look at this and then discuss, um, because I think there will be interesting point to, to discuss. So one of the first important aspects, I think, is the measurement of that gap size. And that's, um, uh, that's quite a difficult um, concept and also a variable measurement uh, between different parts of the, of the valve. And it depends, of course, where you measure that. So what has been adopted here by the core lab is to do several measurements to localize uh, the, the, the place where the clip will be placed and then to average this uh, to, to have um, a quite accurate um, estimate of the gap size. And if you look at, the, at this result, then you see that most of the patients, about, um, uh, uh, about 30 subjects in the study, were between 7 and 9. But that's not only what we see. We see also, and that is reflected by this distribution, we'll see also patients treated with much larger gap, up to uh, 15 uh, millimeter. Um, this measurement were available in a, in a subgroup of the, of the study public, uh, population for yet, but quite representative of the, of the population we treat. And the question, uh, the next question is of course uh, regarding the relationship between gap and procedural success. And you can see if we look at the primary point of the b right acute procedural success, meaning one a reduction of one grade, grade uh, tricuspid regurgitation, then we don't see so much of a difference. But if we are a little bit more picky and look at moderate or less uh, reduction at 30 days, then we see that uh, the patient uh, with a larger gap and a gap of more than 10 millimeters uh, cannot reach um, this, um, this situation and this result uh, in all uh, patients. And we, we have about 40% of the patients that cannot reach moderate or less trichospid regurgitation if they have a gap of more than 10. But interestingly, and that's a very important point I think we can discuss as well, uh, the improvement in terms of quality of life was also uh, seen in patients having a, a bit of less reduction, meaning that probably uh, reducing uh, trichospid regurgitation not only to moderate, but only by one grade has a significant impact on, on quality of life. So maybe we can discuss this part and then uh, go on to the next one. Exactly. So thank you very much for this uh, two pr very, very um, insightful presentations. And they are open for discussion and also open for your, uh, for your questions. Maybe I have a question for you, Marta, first, uh, as, a, as an ima imaging specialist about the gap size. Um, how, how reliable is that how reproducible is that in in the same patient maybe on different days on different occasions on a different fluid state and then in different uh, in different planes uh, could you could you allude a bit on this um, I think I am a little bit critic on that point. <laughs> Measuring the, the gap size is, is cumbersome. I mean, of course, there's a dynamic behavior of the gap because this is a volume chambers and that will depend on the status of the fluid, same as color Doppler. 
but also uh, the measurements rely a little bit on the acquisitions. And it's, this is like in mitral stenosis, no? So you have to be really sure that you are at the tips of the leaflets to really measure the maximum gap. And that sometimes is difficult. Uh, it can be helped with three-dimensional echocardiography, either by using biplane if you are really uh, aligned or by using multiple uh, MPR reconstructions. But uh, we really need to develop a little bit on being more precise on measuring the gap. And of course, that uh, has an impact on the, on the outcomes. I mean, I think the key message from your, your results is that we are able to treat a large variability of anatomies. Probably we, 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 we need to learn more where to establish the limits, but probably our common sense says that the more the larger the gap is, it doesn't mean that it's impossible, but probably it's more difficult to treat. And I think we have to develop a little bit more on exactly how to measure, and that's important on the acquisition of the image. But these data look very, very encouraging. I mean, yeah. uh, in, the, in the triluminate times, we were way more picky, and I think there's Becky sitting, sitting in the row. I think we didn't, didn't include a patient above six, or we were hard in including a patient above six millimeters of gap, and now we see data that even 10 millimeters is, is is not a contraindication at all because results seem to be good as well. I have just one question. Is this gap measurement at screening or is it during general anesthesia? It's during, it's during screening um, before the procedure. Before. Okay, I think we need to move on to the next presentation and then we have some more time to discuss. It's about multi-leaflets. Exactly. So the, the next population of patients, uh, we were interested in the multi-leaflet uh, population. And um, what, what I've shown already, uh, but it, it's worth to, to look at it. So about 70% of the patients had the three leaflets, I would say classical uh, morphology of the valve, uh, of the valve treated. Uh, but that means that 28% of the, of the patients were different. And among them, you have the type 2, which is the two leaflets, which is about 7%. That may be a little bit different in terms of, of treatment. But you then have the multi-leaflet population with uh, the type 3B and 3A. Um, which, is, uh, which is encompassed in the other population, quite a low um, type of morphology in that particular uh, population. So if we look again at the result in terms of success, acute procedural success in that different uh, morphologies, we see actually in that uh, set of data no uh, significant difference in terms of success. Acute procedural success, which is reduction by, of trigospid regurgitation by one grade, and also no difference in the time uh, used for the for the procedure. And if we look now again at moderate or less uh, trigospid regurgitation reduction at uh, 30 days, then we even see that in that particular study, and I'm, I'm sure we will have some reaction, uh, the multi-leaflet uh, anatomy was even better treated or a better result um, without any big difference, I would say, in the improvement of the KCCQ. So, and this is a bit, I uh, wanted to give a perspective also of what has been published before, and, and Georg, you published this very nice study looking also at success um, in terms of res residual tricuspid regurgitation, three or less, uh, after transcatheter edge to edge repair. And we see here quite a big difference and significant difference in terms of result between this anatomy uh, in their favor, I would say, of the more complex anatomy, which is the four leaflet one. So, maybe we can open the, the discussion on this. Um, on, on these discrepancies between uh, results. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, maybe a, a, a question to you is, is a three or four leaflet or five leaflet, is that always a reliable measure or is an intentation always an intentation or could it be something different? So sometimes we, at least I have the impression sometimes I, I, I think in the hybrid room, so this is four or five leaflets and they behave completely different because it's not a real indentation. It's sometimes hard to predict. Could you, could you allude on this and how to overcome this? 
Absolutely. I'm, I'm not sure whether the separation from three leaflets to others is the correct way to, to interpret the data because we have bicuspid valves that are e easy to treat, extremely easy, and there are also others. And then I think more important it is what is the separation and the dominant leaflet. If we have a very dominant and extremely large anterior leaflet, it's easy to treat. If we have three similar size leaflets or we have multiple sub leaflets, like five, six or so, it's more difficult to treat. It's like pulling on a tongue, you open indentations or partial indentations. I totally agree with you that we not always know when we see the screening images whether the indentation goes up to the ring or to the, uh, to the hinge point really, or whether it's in the leaflet itself, a folding and a se separation by different caudal structures. So it's hard to predict this from transgastric views and to be certain. Uh, so, so I think these are very rough analysis that is true for a series of 300 patients. Uh, so we have to simplify, of course, but I think there are other parameters that influence this data massively. And, and in, in, in your hands in, in, in Stuttgart, um, would there be more than, let's say, four leaflets or a gap size of above X, Y? Would that be an exclusion criteria or would you not consider this? Or what is your, what, how do you decide on the, on, on the patient selection? So from an anatomical standpoint, I think we have learned that we can really treat very challenging anatomies. Um, but it is a question of experience, of course. It's not something to start with. And the gap size um, makes it more difficult if it is larger. But uh, it really depends on the whole anatomy of the right ventricle. I think that's something to consider, too. So you can't only look at the valve, but you have to look at the right ventricle. You have to consider how much tension there will be on the leaflets. So if you have the feeling that the tension will be acceptable, you can really treat large gap sizes, but you have to uh, have a specific strategy for that. And with multi-leaflet um, uh, valves, that's not a problem. So we, we just have to consider how to, uh, to start with a strategy, and you have to think much more at the beginning of the procedure. OK. Um. If there is no question here, is there any question from the audience? Yes, please, go up to the mic. Perfect. <coughs> so concerning uh, when we have a large gap size, along with moderate to, to, to severe tethering, we saw some data that would suggest a combination therapy with annuloplasty plus edge to edge uh, re, uh, repair. What's the most uh, annuloplasty technique used of, uh, with edge to edge repair? I think the only annuloplasty device we have available, which is CE, which has a CE mark, is, is a cardioband device. And, and it's a device which you can use. I mean, if you have a lot of tethering, uh, it's not going to be easy to use. And it's probably not going to reduce TR completely. And you have to plan subsequently for a tier device. But admittedly, that this adds also a lot of complexity to the procedure. And, and if you want to do that in one shot, uh, it may take you quite a bit of time. But it is possible, and most of us have done that before. Uh, but I think it's not the default, default strategy. There is another question. Yeah, uh, rather basic question. What is the cutoff value for the pulmonary artery pressures and the cutoff value for the RA size? Because sometimes the RAs are inerismal huge gigantic RAs. So in those situations, does it work or what is so the... It's automatic? pulmonary pressure. Yeah, pulmonary pressures and size of the right atrium. So all the studies excluded mainly systolic pressures, uh, PA pressures of 60. This is always a very rough estimate because we know it's a cr uh, um, estimation three harm to the patient if we have pre-capillary situations. So this doesn't address this. So we also analyzed the pulmonary vascular resistance, which I think is very important. And in our case that we showed in this symposium, we had two wood units, which is favorable. So below three, it's favorable. There's a gray zone, three to five and above five. Uh, this is deleterious and you shouldn't treat the patient with pure precapillary situations, I would say. And this is about 15-20% of all TR situations. I think that's very safe to say yeah. that this is just not a candidate to be treated because the uh, mechanism of action, the uh, mechanism of disease is, com is completely different. You had a suggestion? 
No, the regarding the right uh, atrium, I think there's no limit. I would say uh, you ask also the cutoff for the right atrium diameter. No, so we are learning on if there is a limit on the annulus size. We don't know yet. No, mm. but definitely not for the right atrium. Maybe another question to you: um, If you look at your at your at your place. How many patients out of 100 would you exclude because imaging is just too poor? Is there any any left or I, is this just experience? I think it's experience. Also with experience, you, you uh, learn to rely only if you have limit, limited visualization. So either if you have a good transesophageal or either a transgastric, you can do. Of course, it's not for the first case you do, uh, but I think that discarding uh, a patient for triclip for imaging, I mean, very, very few at the beginning, maybe. But it yeah, it has become rare. I, 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 yeah, tot it's rare. I totally agree. I think we need to move on. We are perfectly on time. And now it's up to uh, Professor Begarecian. He's going to tell us about his experience with triclip dedicated device for tricuspid regurgitation. Yeah, thank you very much. I'd like to uh, quickly give a summary of our experience, uh, how we built up our program and what is the initial result, at least, that we have seen so far. Um, we had some few experience with off-label mitroclip implantations in tricuspid position before 2020, and then early 2020, we started collecting patients for the start of our triclip program, which we then started in July 2020. And uh, our concept was to have a very intensive um, training period. So for the first two weeks, we scheduled 15 patients for triclip implantation, which really helped us to, um, um, which really helped us to have a, a very fast learning curve. And here you can see um, the timeline, how we worked. Uh, it, it was the initial two-week training program. Uh, then after the patient number 57, we introduced uh, the uh, G4 system. And uh, just recently, we implanted the 150th patient. Um, and the concept to uh, have such a program is a dedicated mitral and tricuspid implantation team. You need also a dedicated interventional echocardiography uh, team and a very close collaboration with cardiac surgery. Of course, also, it's very helpful to have an outpatient clinic for the screening process and a very uh, quick and personal response to the referring physicians because it's still a rather new treatment option that we have here. If we look at the first 100 patients, um, the device time, you can see that the device time is decreasing. The very first uh, patients really needed a longer device time, and this is a process that we are seeing that, that is still continuing. And uh, if we look at the different strategies, we just talked about strategies. We prefer a little more the Clover technique. So about 64% of our patients receive the Clover technique and about one third uh, mainly anterior septal uh, clips, one to several. And the other concepts are really uh, rarely necessary. Um, if we look at the individual patients with the TR reduction, we see a TR reduction in uh, actually most of the cases. And uh, if we look at it on a statistical level, we can see it's a very clear and consistent uh, reduction of TR uh, before and after the triclip implantation. If we look at the 150 patients that we have treated so far, I think it is very important to mention that the in-hospital mortality was 0%. And I think this is a major information here. These are extremely sick patients, and still we have a very high safety profile. If we regard more than one degree reduction as successful, we had a 98% success rate. And the main complication that we saw were seven patients with gastric bleedings, and these were only seen in the first 50 patients. We were still in a training period with longer device time, long transgastric views. And we, um, uh, with the uh, advancement of the procedure and also with the use of proton pump inhibitors that we just introduced for all patients who get a triclip, um, we didn't see any further gastric bleedings in the patients 51 to 150. Interestingly, we saw a weight loss, in-hospital weight loss between admission and discharge without changing the diuretics. So this was a three kilogram weight loss that was statistically significant and might be already due to uh, initial effects of the reduced TR. 
And if we look at some of our preliminary follow-up data, after three months, we see a consistent reduction in tricuspid regurgitation. We see a significant reduction in heart failure symptoms. Uh, we also see a significant uh, improvement in quality of life. And very interestingly, we see a significant improvement um, of uh, the albumin levels, so they increased, and which might be due to the fact that we have less venous congestion in the intestinal tract. And uh, with this outlook, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much for this very encouraging data, which mirror more or less the data we have seen in, 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 the, in all the studies and also at other uh, real-world data sets. Um, I think one point is, the most important point we haven't really tackled is safety. Uh, so it's, it's very good that you raised this point again. <laughs> it's an extremely safe procedure and uh, in all of the studies we didn't have any, any fatalities uh, in the 30 days data and this is I think uh, extremely important for this device. Any any further questions? Yeah, from do the we audience? have s uh, some questions from the audience uh, asking on the um, potential of this therapy uh, in patients uh, who have leads, uh, are we pacing leads? Um, we saw in the results that the proportion of patients, even in the B right, are treated are having leads. Is that makes it dif more difficult? What do you think? Um, it's feasible. There is, there is about uh, between 15 and 20 percent of the patient included in all study having lead. Uh, the proportion is a bit higher even in the in the trival registry, and um, and the results are comparable. So we don't see um, it's it's about selection of the patient probably and looking into um, the the mechanism of tricuspid regurgitation is a lead, um, the cause of tricuspid regurgitation or not is a fusion of the lead with the leaflet, uh, but after selection of that patient <coughs> for a therapy, there is no big difference in terms of outcome. I think. Yeah, and I think most of the patients who do have impingement of, of a leaflet by, by the lead are going to be excluded from the trials and also for, from any treatment because we can't really deal with these patients unless we explant the, the lead. Any, yeah. any urgent also other questions? Also on the, on the role of the length of the leaflets. So uh, th they're asking in the, in the b right study uh, if we know um, that, that the proportion of patients that were excluded because of leaflet restric motion restriction or, or short leaflets, which is probably the number one cause for restriction. Or what do you think in your experience? Is that the principal reason to exclude because it's not imaging, it's not lead, we have told? I mean, what's <laughs> that's the main reason? The shortest leaflet is the septal leaflet, and it's shortest in the interior commissure. As we're le getting longer clips, we move more and more central, and the septal leaflet there gets longer. So I see almost no exclusion by two short septal leaflets. All mural leaflets are always beyond uh, uh, three centimeters, so it's no problem uh, not to treat patients. So leaflet length is not a problem. Yeah, I, I would totally agree. I think we need to come, uh, come to an end. Uh, we have a few, uh, two more slides to go. Uh, I, I, I should recall you, these are all more or less uh, still uncontrolled data. We see benefit. Uh, we see that we can treat the patients, that we can reduce tricuspid regurgitation, that we somehow can improve also clinical performance of the patients. But that is true for all the devices. We don't have a controlled randomized trial. And therefore, we need to have this in order to find out, do we really help the patient in terms of mortality? or hospitalization for heart failure. And that's what the triluminate pivotal trial is about. Here you can see again the design of the trial. It's a randomized trial. You can see it here in the bluish color. They're going to be randomized one to one once. A team has, has judged that the patient can be reduced to TR moderate or less. And then they're going to be randomized to medical therapy or the triclip therapy. If not, they're going to go in a single in a single arm in a, a registry type of, of, of study and there 
will be follow up as well. On the left side, you can see the primary endpoints. Primary endpoint is a composite, is a hierarchical composite of, of mortality, hospitalization for heart failure, need for reintervention or tricuspid uh, valve surgery, and also a quality of life assessed by the Kansas City Cardiomyopathy Questionnaire. You have seen the KCQ score before. These are on my last slide. These are just the key inclusion and exclusion criteria that come without saying patient has to have uh, symptoms, has to have a tricuspid regurgitation, and all the other issues should, should have been de dealt with. For example, on the left side, so mitral regurgitation should have been treated before. Uh, this comes also without saying. And here again is the pulmonary hypertension which is a contraindication if it exceeds 70 millimeters of mercury. And I think that was it. Uh, I hope we could show you and, and convince you that the triclip therapy is, is a very uh, vivid uh, therapeutic option for our patients with tricuspid regurgitation. They do have a lot of symptoms. They do have a poor prognosis. And I'm absolutely convinced that we can help these patients with this device. And the most important message to take home is it's a very safe procedure. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much the faculty yeah. for, being, for being together, discussing together and presenting and I hope for a successful convention for all of you. Thank you.